Hi, my name is Alex Hahn, and um, this year in ISM I'm studying marine biology. So imagine this, I'm in first grade, um, I'm super excited because Ms. Compton tells us we're going to the aquarium. Um, my parents, I beg my parents to chaperone and they say yes. We get there that morning and uh, my teacher is going around giving around stickers telling us what group we're going to be in. My friend gets the sea turtle and one of my other friends gets the dolphins and then Miss Compton comes to me and puts a big fat manatee on my t-shirt. I am very angry because I don't want the fat sea cow. I don't want the manatee. I was very angry. Um, my mom told me to cut it out. She kind of pinched my arm and she said, cut it out. That's not how we act. So I get over it. We ride the bus. I'm super excited with all my friends and we get to the aquarium. I look at the sea turtles and I get to go see the stingrays and then finally my mom says honey you and your group need to see the manatees and I throw a fit again I don't want to see the manatees that is not the animal that I like and I didn't want that manatee to be my group name she of course makes me and I'm in first grade so I listen to mom I follow her to the manatees and I just kind of fall in love at first sight with them it completely changed everything and turned things around for me. I don't exactly know what it was, but I imagine it's what you feel when you fall in love for the first time. I had gained a respect for these animals that are so graceful and gentle, um, and that's what kind of started my love for marine biology. So my first, whoops, my first interview was with Dr. Benjamin Newman, and this was really cool. Um, he, his interview was kind of out of the blue. I found him and I was like, oh, that's super cool. He's the head of biology at Texas a and Texarkana, so let's go for it. And so I made the three-hour drive and I went to visit him. And he was super cool. He showed me fossils and he showed me about how most of the fossils that we find now are marine because the ocean used to be so covered. Um, the ocean used to cover the earth um, vastly more than it does now. Um, and he told me that you might need um, over time to change things and sometimes what you love might change, um, but that's okay. My second interview was with Chris Robeson and he's the president of Bioaquatic Testing. Um, his interview was cool because I actually had already gotten to meet him previously on a trip I took to Bioaquatic Testing and um, on the trip I took before I got to actually go behind the scenes and I got to see um, their fish farming methods and how they test waters for pollution um, and actually the EPA sets regulations on corporations and what they get to do is test their water um, and make sure that it's within those limits and if not uh, they can get them in big trouble. Christina Henderson, she was another one, and she's the quality assurance manager there. Um, I really enjoyed talking to her because she showed me a little bit about what she got to do in the marine science field. She collects data mostly, but if there is problems in the lab, she is um, very qualified to go back and help them and actually run the lab if need be. So my research. So before I could start anything, um, with my research on the ocean, I had to get a grasp on how large the ocean actually is. Um, it is about 97% of the, our water source on Earth. It is huge. Um, it's so deep and I kind of didn't understand at first. I was frustrated because we don't know a whole lot about the ocean. We don't know as much as we think we do. Um, but I had to take a step back and realize that it's because the ocean is so vast um, we don't even have the means to explore half of it. So the ocean needs us and we're not doing our part. Um, awareness and conservation is going to be my big focus in this career. Um, there are so many things I could do. I could go nonprofit. I could go and make my own consultation company. There's so many things I could do, but um, I'm definitely going to work with the conservation of marine mammals. So the reason I love marine mammals so great whites are vulnerable. They're actually not considered a marine mammal, but I have a special love for marine rights. They used to be endangered, but um, now they're just vulnerable. And there's different levels. Um, there is uh, vulnerable, threatened, endangered, and critically endangered. Um, and great whites are vulnerable, so that's still not good. We want to push them away from any of those categories, but they are no longer threatened. Corals are experiencing traumatic stress. And this is an indicator to us that marine mammals could be harmed. Um, human activity is harming the right whale. He, this little guy right here, 
he is endangered, and the vaquita porpoise, um, one of the loves of my life, um, this little marine mammal is actually critically endangered. And we may be on the brink of the world's mass, sixth mass, ex mass extinction. Um, and the scariest part is, is that uh, marine mammals are probably going to be the first to go. Um, we are seeing, this is the first time in history that we are seeing an effect on our world's oceans. Normally we're affecting um, our land ecosystems, our tropical rainforests, but um, we're actually detrimentally affecting our oceans now for the first time in, um, in the history of an extinction. So this is my mentor, um, and she's pretty awesome. Her name is Amy Witt, and she's the CEO and senior scientist of her own company. She's, a, she class, she's classified as a marine mammalogist, so uh, the same exact thing I wanted to be. Um, I basically knew from the moment I met her that she was it. Um, I texted Coach Goff, and Coach Goff was like, if you like her, go for it. So on our first meeting, right in the middle of our meeting, I'm like, hey, would you like to be my mentor for my ISM program? And it's the first time I'm ever meeting her, and she says, yes, of course, I would love to. We swap information, and then um, the rest is history. So um, without Amy, I would have never known about the endangered white whale. I would have never even thought about the vaquita porpoise. Um, I know I've heard about it before because it's always been um, under our radar, but I've never looked into it as much as I have now. And I also would have never known about bomb testing in the Navy um, inside our oceans. And they also train bottlenose dolphins, and we'll get more to that later. So my original work, um, I decided to make a scientific proposal to implement biodegradable fishing that's in the commercial fishing industry. And um, I got this idea because of Amy. She told me, hey, I told her about the idea for a bi biodegradable fishing net, and I knew just generally that would help the ocean. But when she told me to check out the vaquita porpoise, um, things changed and I, I really started hitting home with it. Um, and then of course sea turtles. I went down to Daytona Beach um, over the break and I saw their sea turtle um, little panels they have everywhere about um, how they're endangered and what we can do to help. Oh, sorry. So what I know about the vaquita porpoise is that um, there are 47 of them left on this earth. At the um, at our showcase at the Star, um, I was talking to a bunch of little kids, and um, they were actually very smart. It was um, very impressive, and I was like, "So, kids, um, the vaquita whale is critically endangered, which is the most endangered um, an animal can be classified as. So, how many do you think are left on this earth?" And I got someone say 400. I got someone say 1,000. Someone said 2,000. I was like, those are good guesses because those are very low numbers. But, kids, there's 47. There's 47 vaquita porpoises left on this entire earth. And their single greatest cause of fatality is entanglement in gill nets that are abandoned. Um, they're also caught as bycatch. There's this big fish called the totowaba. And it's in the Gulf of California where the vaquita live. And it's about the same size as the vaquita. The vaquita is the smallest porpoise known um, on Earth. It's about the same size, and fishermen there go and illegally fish the totowaba. And as bycatch, they accidentally catch the vaquita, and because there's hooks on gill nets, um, they throw back the vaquita dead or dying. Um, I had to kind of take a step back from my original work. My Everything inside me wants me to attack, attack, attack um, the fishermen. But then I had to put myself in their shoes and realize there's social issues over there also. There are financial issues over there also. Um, this is a not very wealthy part of Mexico um, that is fishing this, and so I have to understand, put myself in these shoes. Fishermen, when they catch a totoaba, and that's how they're accidentally catching the vaquita, they're getting thousands of dollars for one totoaba bladder, and they're selling them to Asia. So I have to understand, they're not just gonna stop because this is how they make their money. They have to feed their family. Just like you and I, they have to find a means of living. And so I had to take a step back and I knew I'm not gonna write a proposal to implement the ban of fishing in the Gulf of California. I'm not gonna try to ban gill nets. Um, I just had to take a step back and kind of compromise. And that compromise was um, to implement the use of biodegradable fishing nets. 
Now some biodegradable fishing nets, or regular fishing nets, nylon fishing nets that are used can take 40 years to break down. And that's a long time. And millions of marine mammals can get caught every year in the fishing nets. So millions upon millions and millions of animals can be killed. Now with a biodegradable fishing net, I'm not gonna be able to make one that will break down in three days or four days or five days. It will break down in about four years. But if you compare that to 40, that's a big improvement. Once it's gone, all those other 36 years, it can't do harm to marine mammals. So I had to compromise. It's still not the greatest thing in the world. There are still gonna be vaquita fatalities, I'm afraid. But I think that this is the greatest step towards us saving all marine mammals, not just the vaquita porpoise, even though um, that's gonna be my main focus. So I also saw that there was an ocean of darkness and death, but an infinite ocean of light and love which flowed over the ocean of darkness. So this quote to me meant a lot. I am going to face challenges in this career. I'm gonna have people tell me that I can't do things and I am going to face people like fishermen who don't have the same views as me. Maybe they don't see what I see. Um, they don't try to see what I see and I completely understand, but um, there's something so much bigger up ahead. There's, so much, there's something so much bigger after all of this. This whole thing is bigger than me and it's bigger than you and it's bigger than all of us put together. And um, it's gonna take hard work, but I am definitely willing to work at it. Thank you. I don't know how to turn this off.